the words. So it is great to see everybody. It's an incredibly intense moment right now for, for CLASP and for the policy world and for people who care about the anti-poverty and racial justice agenda. It's capping an incredibly intense two years with the pandemic, the recession, the racial justice reckoning and movement, as well as really some quite extraordinary legislative achievements um, in the emergency response legislation to COVID, the American Rescue Plan Act and other response legislation. And then the legislation that's before Congress, before the Senate right now, the Build Back Better legislation, which incorporates many ideas that CLASP and I personally have been advocating for for decades that would make an enormous difference to families. But of course, it's also a moment of devastating threats to voting rights, to reproductive health, to our democracy. So it's just a very intense moment when all those things are true at the same time, extraordinary opportunities and threats. So that made us think this would be a good time for a session to go deeper into the national policy agenda, both where we've been this year and where we're going. And in a moment, you're gonna have hear a terrific panel of my extraordinary class colleagues to give you some rich and in-depth examples. But before I turn it over to the panel, um, I wanted to make three big picture framing points. The first is just to underline what an extraordinary moment this is as we anticipate passage of the Build Back Better legislation. For me, I've spent decades on many of these issues about families and children of low incomes. So this is a moment with a chance that, you know, maybe comes once in a generation to fix longstanding and devastating US policy failures and change the opportunity of a whole generation of children and young people for the better. It's a chance to go from failed and inadequate childcare policies that have left um, families unable to afford childcare, workers without a decent wage, um, children in inadequate settings, to go from that to a near universal guarantee of access to childcare for parents of young children. It's a chance to fix a huge failure of US policy for parents and workers, which goes back decades, the absence of paid leave, meaning that large shares of workers, especially workers of color and workers with low wages, don't have the chance to have a day off to take care of themselves or a baby or a loved one with an illness. And so enacting universal national paid leave for everybody would be a huge change. And it's a chance to enact a children's allowance through the refundable child tax credit that would already has temporarily and would in the future dramatically reduce the devastatingly high child poverty rates that have characterized the United States for decades, worse than other rich countries, particularly devastating for black and Latino children, and really just devastating our future because of the way we've treated our youngest children and our youngest families. And so it's a chance to really change things um, in a very big way. There are also potential strong improvements in other areas you'll hear about in health and mental health, um, workforce and subsidized jobs, access to benefits for immigrant families. So the question of whether this passes and what it looks like is very important. This is a very intense moment. Second big framing point I wanted to make is that class is very deeply involved in seizing those opportunities that I've just talked about. We're deeply involved in the design and technical aspects of the legislation and the debate about legislation, including drafting potential legislative language, providing data and perspectives to illuminate the choices and in many other ways. We're deeply involved in elevating our core racial equity and anti-poverty values and big picture narratives, seeking to influence the context for the conversation. We're deeply involved in elevating and amplifying the voices of people we work with, including people with lived experience. You're gonna hear some of that in the panel. And we're also focusing on the next step after passing legislation, because just passing the legislation doesn't change people's lives you have to actually do a lot of work for those ideas in the legislation to change lives. And that work, and you can call in shorthand implementation. 
So in 2021, we've been doing that hard work of implementation related to the provisions of the American Rescue Plan Act and the other response legislation. So for example, you don't cut child poverty just by enacting an expanded child tax credit. It has to actually get into people's hands. And so we work on that. And for 2022, we're planning for that intense work of implementation um, once, if, but I'm gonna say once, um, BBB passes. So you're gonna hear a lot of detail about this in the panel, about the way in which class unique roles play out in each of the policy areas. And the third thing I wanna say is that all of this work that class does, it's required us to be really nimble and flexible. I mean, the, the pandemic, the recession, the opportunity for big change and racial justice and anti-poverty initiatives, none of those were easily predictable. And so we had to be able to hold on to our core values and mission and ideas um, and be able to adapt in how we advance them. And the reason we were able to do that is because of you. It's because of the investments from our network of funders and donors and supporters who believed in us and believed in us enough to offer sustained and flexible resources. So the accomplishments and our hope for accomplishments of the future that we'll talk about today are because of you. So our plan for the rest of this session is for you to hear more from Hannah Matthews, who's CLASP's Deputy Executive Director for Policy and a terrific panel of CLASP colleagues who she'll introduce. Um, Hannah is amazing, many of you know her. She came to our direct deputy for policy role after many years at CLASP, including directing the Child Care and Early Childhood team. Um, she spent um, a period of time in the Obama administration on a, on a temporary assignment because they needed her to write regulations and effectively implement child care reforms. So she has that inside perspective as well. Um, and as you'll hear, she's just an extraordinary advocate. So she'll introduce the panel. Please stay on mute during the panel presentations. And then we have lots of time for questions, conversation, discussion, um, and we're very eager for, for that conversation. So with that, let me turn it over to Hannah. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Olivia remarked in her opening, it's been an extremely intensive year, one filled with uh, both ongoing deep challenges for our country, but also unprecedented opportunities for policy change. And it's the latter that we're going to talk most about today. Um, we have been actively working to advance uh, what Olivia referred to, the Build Back Better, this act, the once in a generation legislation with the opportunity to really transform the lives of children and families. As an organization, I believe CLASP continues to punch above its weight in terms of impact, and we're excited to be able to share just a small sampling of that work today. Through the panel that I'll introduce shortly, we will focus primarily on the legislative agenda, the Build Back Better Act that has passed the U.S. House of Representatives and um, could be on the floor of the Senate as soon as next week. Uh, before we get to this, I wanna share just a bit about the work we've been doing in addition to our federal advocacy. And again, as Olivia shared, really looking at the implementation that we've been doing already thus far. Earlier this year, CLASP staff worked hard to shape the contents of the American Rescue Plan Act. That was the emergency uh, legislation signed into law in March in response to the ongoing COVID pandemic. And CLASP advocacy really had a number of of accomplishments um, in that piece. One area I'll highlight was CLASP's work to bring to light the growing crisis um, in childcare. This was a problem before the pandemic, but uh, became even more dire and, and remains a very serious um, situation today. Our efforts with those of our partners resulted in a total of nearly $50 billion in childcare relief funds being made available to states. Now that amount is several times the amount of money that has been allocated for childcare in the past. And so the team has been working with state agencies, with advocates to really ensure the most effective use of childcare dollars to stabilize the childcare sector and to do so in ways in that really center 
um, and get resources to providers and parents and communities of color who have experienced the worst impacts of the crisis, um, COVID, as well as the economic crisis and the childcare crisis. Another accomplishment that I'll highlight was the creation of a monthly child allowance through reforms to the child tax credit. Here too, CLASP's expertise on implementation was really essential as we quickly work to support the White House and federal agencies to really ensure that the hardest to reach families would benefit from the credit. So making sure that mixed immigration status families, those that don't speak English, those who are unbanked, um, that we really made sure that everyone would benefit from this credit. And these two examples, and of course there are many more, um, are important because the child care and the child tax credit investments, as well as expansion of the earned income tax credit for young adults, these were temporary relief efforts, and they are also at the heart of our ongoing advocacy in that Build Back Better. Because of our expertise in how policies play out on the ground and how essential policy design is to ensuring access to benefits, we have looked at the successful implementation of the American Recovery Plan as critical to laying the political, the policy groundwork to be able to pass and then successfully implement the transformative investments in Build Back Better. So now turning to this potential end of year package. Clearly, we I will say at the outset, we do not have a crystal ball. No one knows exactly how things will go in the Senate, uh, when, whether uh, BBB passes and in what shape. But because of how deeply consequential and impactful that legislation would be, um, and because there are so many policy areas within it that really cut, a, cut across the work that CLASP has been doing, um, whether it's addressing child poverty, whether it's reducing family childcare costs, the expansion of health coverage, I could go on and on. Um, because of the importance, we are moving full steam ahead to really do everything we can to help get this legislation enacted and to be prepared to help implement it in states and in communities. So we are optimistic about that. Um, so I'm gonna introduce the panelists and um, ask questions of each of them. I'm really grateful for my, to my colleagues for joining me today. We will be saving um, lots of time at the end for questions. So please do go ahead, stay on mute please during the panel conversation. We'll take questions at the end, but if you have questions during the course of the um, event and wanna put them in the chat, that's perfectly fine as well. So um, introducing my panelists, um, in the order that we'll, we'll have a conversation. First, we have Trelon Shorter, who is our Director of Legislative Affairs. Dewey Pham, who is a Senior Policy Analyst on our cross-cutting justice work that, that works um, across the organization. Stephanie Schmidt, our Director of Child Care and Early Education. And then we will hear from Wendy Cervantes, our Director of Immigration and Immigrant Families. So looking forward to um, hearing from them all. So I'm gonna start with Trelon for the big picture on the, the federal um, context. So Trelon, as we've said, there is so much in Build Back Better that would advance the well-being of children and families uh, with low incomes and to advance racial equity. As we said, we can't cover it all in this presentation, but give us the flavor of what's been class priorities in particular for advocacy. Sure, and, and happy to be with everyone today. You know, we spent a lot of time sort of assessing what may, would make the most sense for class to focus our time given our uh, capacity needs. And what we realized was that there were five uh, core areas that would have the greatest impact on alleviating poverty and improving racial equity. And so we use that to really um, narrow down our list. And those five areas are uh, child care and pre-K. We're excited about those investments. Those investments are uh, the largest set of, second largest set of investments in Build Back Better after climate change. Um, from there, uh, the CTC, the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. So again, emphasis on children, but then also youth and uh, childless adults. And then um, 
We looked at uh, paid leave, thinking about workforce development, and so bringing that into close, clearer focus. So uh, we supported and advocated for a paid family and medical leave. Uh, there's four weeks in the House bill. And then, and as well as subsidize employment, again, em emphasizing the needs of the workers. Um, we learned a lot from the pandemic and, um, and building upon our learnings, we, we wanted to see greater investments in subsidized employments, integrating our work on justice programs and those who are returning into society from um, uh, in incarceration. So that was uh, the fourth aspect of our work in, that we were leading on in Build Back Better. And finally, around mental health and healthcare coverage. And so, again, you can't be in a pandemic. Can't you, It was not to our benefit to not utilize the learnings uh, that we got from the pandemic stage one during the, the shutdown to make sure that all uh, people would have access to uh, various resources to support them through things like the pandemic. So those are our five areas. Thanks. And I, I use the term punching above our weight. I, I also often called clasp small but mighty. So give us um, a little bit of a sense again about what it was about CLASP's, you know, mission, structure, capacity that has really allowed us to be effective in our legislative advocacy. So I would say that there are three things that uh, worked to our advantage. I think number one, um, timing of the fact that there was no better time to be an anti-poverty organization than now. We, we were uh, poised from the beginning um, of, of the pandemic to be able to uh, bring to bring to Congress and the administration the learnings that we and our policy experts uh, had. Um, it was, you know, having also having an administration and a congressional majority deeply committed to an anti-poverty agenda worked in our favor, uh, despite the narrow margins. Uh, and again, like I said, the tragedy of the COVID-19 brought so many of our issues uh, we worked on into clearer focus. We also developed uh, a strong organizational posture at the outset which was to secure as much money as possible, to support as many people as possible for as long as possible and make implementation of the programs as effective as possible. So then I think that then that led us to the uh, second reason is around our technical expertise. And so um, our technical expertise gets us into places and spaces that many grassroots organizations cannot. Uh, it also helped uh, having class colleagues with state and federal implementation expertise. Uh, I think this allowed us to critically think through uh, possible trade-offs and implementation challenges and place us really in a unique position um, to be able to advise the Hill, the administration, and even our stakeholders on the best possible program design. Um, and, and, and we spent a lot of time working with uh, very closely with committee staff, key committees on the Hill, um, and then again with strategic partners. And then finally, I would say the third area that really helped us a lot um, be successful in our advocacy and is, is around our strategic leadership. And that, you know, we were, as you heard Olivia say, we were internally, we were very nimble um, and, rel and we were relatively organized. And so we were able to coordinate across uh, administrative advocacy, legislative, and our communications teams. We have a lot of work with partners and coalitions as well. So we're gonna um, hear from the other members of the team to go in deeper in particular policy areas, but maybe just first, Trelon, um, an example or two of where, how you would show that CLASP has been playing a particularly impactful role. Well, I would say that um, across the board, our policy teams have had an impactful year. Uh, I, I would spotlight, um, you know, we, we participated in multiple staff level briefings on child care, on subsidized employment, and even um, Olivia had multiple opportunities to work directly with members, uh, particularly with Senator Warren about state care, child care implementation concerns as we were as the section for childcare was being drafted during the House process. 
And then even uh, Olivia is participating in a principals only meeting with uh, Senator Murray. Um, our child care team, which you'll hear from later in our panel, but they were deeply involved in cost analysis and implementation design and, and legislative drafting. Our, um, ed and, our, our technical advice on and design of the ed and labor and finance staff, we work very closely with those, those staff and we co-led a salon for congressional staff to allow then the space in a confidential setting to explore some key issues um, around our subsidized employment work. And so um, very much engaged on subsidized jobs and initiatives moving as part of the Build Back Better negotiations. Um, so things like civilian climate core, um, workforce development negotiations, those were all areas in which our teams had very much um, engagement on, and it was not just linked to Build Back Better, but even uh, uh, policies that are outside that scope. So um, again, we were very much on the immigration team, our and our income and work support team um, played an active role on implement, both on implementation and the permanent extension of the uh, child tax credit. And we've been able to leverage our expertise on immigration and our networks uh, through both a campaign that we help um, facilitate the public, the Protecting Immigrant Families campaign, as well as the Children Thrive Action Network, pushing through the, using those coalitions and our leadership within those coalitions to push for inclusion for mixed status families throughout the Build Back Better, um, within Build Back Better. And so making sure that the CTC is uh, available for children who do not have social security numbers. and. Um, and I would and, and to close out, you know, our knowledge of administrative rules and low wage work uh, was useful in helping to forward off proposals around work requirements. Great, thank you. Um, going to, we were all sitting in a room. We'd move down the line to the next panelist, um, and going to build a little on your uh, what you told us about the subsidized employment work. So, um, Dewey. In our advocacy efforts, um, we have really advocated for investment in subsidized employment with a particular focus on individuals who face some of the biggest barriers to employment and population-wise really focusing on youth and young adults and focusing on individuals impacted by the justice system. So tell us a little bit, ground us in why this is so important and what programs we're likely to see in Build Back Better that would advance these employment opportunities for individuals. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Um, and hi, everybody. It's really great to be here and, um, and see you all. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, as Olivia mentioned in Chalon, um, you know, we've been really focused on subsidized employment, which really is, you know, pay, paid job opportunities um, that are funded with public uh, dollars. So, you know, we see this a lot, but um, one of the things, reasons why we really emphasize this this time around was we recognize that, you know, as Olivia mentioned earlier, what an opportunity this moment was with the pandemic to really think about redressing some of the deep-seated inequities that we knew existed um, in our country and to kind of re, uh, reimagine what could be possible. So for example, you know, we already knew that young people, especially young people of color, were unemployed at just you know, at much higher rates than the general public and their white counterparts. We also knew that people with criminal records were unemployed about five times the rate of the the, um, the general public. Um, and this was all pre-pandemic, right? And of course, greater disparities for black and brown um, folks who had been formerly incarcerated. So when we think about work, you know, a lot of the work that we've done around workforce development has always you know, been really a lot about training, workforce training. Um, but, you know, we know that not a lot of young people who are also per primary provider, care providers for their families um, are primary earners for their families, um, can't necessarily afford to take 12 weeks off to do a, a job training program that might or might not lead to a job. And so we really focus a lot of our efforts on elevating kind of career pathway, earn and learn types of opportunities. Um, again, all pre-pandemic. And so once this pandemic hit, we, we recognized, and you know, here we have several networks of uh, practitioners in the field that we were hearing from that, you know, 
one, they still are, there was still a need to provide services to young people, to people with, with records and, and job training services. And they were still trying to make that happen without any additional support from uh, resources from the federal government in terms of uh, in, in, in funding um, for the course. Because I think a lot of the times at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were kept hearing, oh, like we're just about focused on rescuing right now. Like, you know, we can't think about getting people back to work right now because things are closed. But at the same time, a lot of these programs are moving virtual and um, they were still trying to operate in a different environment. And what we, again, what we had heard and an opportunity for us to reimagine and really rethink some of our the country's deep-seated inequities and to address them was to, you know, move beyond just training and, and really move towards uh, thinking more about like guaranteed jobs or transitional employment um, and pathways to, to economic opportunity for people who had been historically um, excluded from, from, from this. So again, focusing on young people, focusing on people impacted by the justice system and, um, and, and really putting out there that it's not just about, um, you know, this is one way to get money into people's pockets as well to during a pandemic where, you know, this population has really been excluded and there's not necessarily been too many targeted solutions for young people, for people with um, criminal records as well. So, you know, we weren't seeing a lot of investment in, into these, um, into the economic security of, of, of these two communities. Um, and so, you know, I think that was very clear from us beginning that we needed some really concrete, um, bold vision for it, what employment was and to really target some of these opportunities because we also knew that the whole country was going to be facing massive unemployment because of the pandemic. And there was going to be a huge need for services. But we recognize that if with, with this huge need, the populations, young people, young people of color, people with criminal records would likely be excluded or not be prioritized. And it would kind of continue the system in the cycle of um, exclusion. So, you know, from the onset, we really were really intentional about saying we needed a high quality subsidized jobs program, which meant, you know, people would earn credentials while they um, were training for a job and also getting paid for it. It was like kind of like on the job types of training, like your apprenticeship programs, that those are kind of the most common ones, but they take many forms. And then also just like recognizing that a lot of our partners, a lot of people we work, folks we worked with um, were, you know, targeting these programs to young people and people impacted by the justice system. Well, um, we actually, Hannah and I just had lunch with um, the Center for Employment Opportunities folks today and um, which operate a subsidized employment program using SNAP um, employment training dollars. Um, and the way their model works is they each, uh, they only um, hire people who are formerly incarcerated and they get paid every single day. And just rec understanding what that meant for somebody to get a paycheck every single day, especially during a pandemic after you've been incarcerated was just, you know, it was clear to us that that's, you know, that's the path we needed to, to go towards and, and advocating for recovery and something that could be more long-term as well. Um, so obviously this was a fight. It went, didn't come very easily, but, um, you know, getting our partners together and everything and really advocating for this, one of the, you know, opportunities that did arise was a big emphasis on the Civilian Climate Corps, um, which I think many of you guys might have heard about, um, a proposed, you know, for the for initially from the Biden administration to kind of do this WPA style New Deal um, program of like a civilian climate corps, but with higher wages um, and just kind of and, and and that was kind of the vision. And so, really, essentially, a subsidized jobs program. But again, we were just very worried that this type of equity wasn't going to be baked into this like a thirty billion dollar investment. There would be no targeting and whatnot. So, you know. Fortunately, we were able to kind of get on top of that at the beginning. We had a lot of meetings with the White House, um, with members of Congress, with you know, agency staff as well to just kind of see what would be possible. And we're able to get in the um, most recent version of the bill, a uh, $5 billion, you know, not as much as we would have hoped, but a, a significant amount of money, um, a $5 billion carve out from the climate jobs that would be um, directed, that would be responsible for D Department of Labor to to, um, to disperse. Um, and then within that 5 billion, the programs are targeted to young people. And there's a, a, actually a $1 billion um, set aside for people um, who've been impacted by the criminal legal system that I, we're really um, excited to see. That's like the largest investment that's in workforce training that this that has ever been made. Um, and it's all been, you know, really a 
testament and a part of this kind of building back better, but also reinvesting and and um, rethinking and kind of investing in equity and redressing some of the deep seated inequities. So um, yes, I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, thank you. It's it's been a tremendous a tremendous accomplishment to see the the focus um, on on individuals and on youth, which is what I want to ask you about next. So um, I mentioned at the outset, Dewey is our uh, leads our justice work, which is a cross cutting area of work, and he sits on class youth team. The youth policy team has been very intentional about um, really working directly with youth and youth led organizations and you have been directly engaging young people in this advocacy work. So can you share a bit about the range of ways in which you've engaged young leaders in the work on the Hill and with the White House? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so if you all don't know about it yet, we launched last year an initiative called A New Deal for Youth. Um, it's really exciting. We're working with about 50 young change makers from across the country on co-creating a youth policy platform um, and New Deal. So really through that, we also just kind of, you know, been really intentional, like Hannah said, about building networks of young people, young leaders that we can kind of, you know, lean on or who can provide us feedback and just check us when we need to be um, checked as well. So some of the opportunities that came up this summer were really exciting. Um, and I was just reflecting on this recently because it's like I actually started at class like right in 2016 in the summer, right before the Trump uh, administration. And, and then this year, obviously, just being so, I kind of spent four years in that environment and didn't attach too much engagement with <laughs> the ad, administration. But then it's just been like kind of a complete 180, I think, in those now, even during the pandemic, and just kind of having that access very early on. One of the things the White House did commit to, and that's kind of maintained a commitment to, is with through their Office of Public Engagement doing bi weekly youth calls. So we sit on a call with them and sometimes, you know, have. Um, Every, about every other week and invited some of the other, our young leaders there to just kind of work. One, it's a kind of a feedback loop from the administration to let us know what, how they are prioritizing young people and just to continue to, re the repetition especially, because one of the challenges in, in, AR, in the American Rescue Plan and also in Build Back Better was there wasn't really any youth specific language in any of it. It was all more universal. And so, you know, we were really adamant in this group with our other partners about um, saying that young people really needed direct support or like at least some kind of guidance that young people could access these funds. We were finding that like 90% of young unemployed young people didn't get a stimulus or first stimulus check for a first stimulus check, for example. Um, and so, you know, through that, like we worked with the administration, brought in some of the young change makers into these calls. We, um, you know, worked with the administration on a youth fact sheet for Build Back Better. So that was, you know, it felt like a good accomplishment as well as just, you know, the administration looked at Build Back Better, picked, pulled out all the pieces that were youth focused and kind of released that as a separate fact sheet saying Build Back Better would help young people, young parents especially. Um, we were able to participate in the um, White House's uh, second uh, ever uh, um, uh, Instagram Live that we did um, in back in May, I guess it was, we called it the Build Back Better After Party build back better with youth after party. Um, and so we did that on Instagram live, had a bunch of young people, had some slam poetry, um, and that was hosted from the White House Office of Public Engagement um, official account. So that was a really you know, exciting moment. And then we also were invited, um, myself and several change makers to, um, to the White House to actually speak on a, um, a panel with uh, Cedric Richmond, who's the Director of Office of Public Engagement, specifically around how youth employment was a violence prevention strategy. And that, you know, as Hannah mentioned, you know, really being intentional engaging young people, a lot of the young people who, uh, all the young people that we brought to that table had direct experience with violence, with families, members being incarcerated or had been incarcerated themselves, um, then had, you know, within the um, foster care system as well. And, you know, having that space and kind of elevating their voices to the table, you know, was really, I think, powerful for me to see, but also I think for the administration to be intentional and to see what leaders there were um, at the table to, to really force some of these ideas. And I guess that happened in June. And then, you know, so now we're kind of looking at this, um, what, what kind of the resulting of all those meetings and stuff is sort of this like investment in employment, youth employment, a brand new youth subsidized employment program that we've, you know, really pushed for. Um, all kind of under this violence prevention framework. 
The idea of really engaging individuals who are directly impacted by the policies that we work on is something that we have been doing more of across class, um, really thinking about. And so just share a little bit about in terms of the youth engagement, what the goal is here and what you're learning from the process. Yeah, no, I think the biggest lesson we've, I've, you know, taken from this too, is like access, it's like we have a really great, you know, the administration is very um, accessible for the, for at least, again, again, for me, for the first time in my career, uh, you know, the access piece is there, but the access isn't always necessarily, like, I think towing that line, you know, it's really exciting for me, for example, to go to the White House, but, you know, I think all of the young people, they really push us to say, like, well, what happened after that? What was, like, what are the follow-up next steps? It's not just, um, you know, they're really um, holding us accountable, I think, in, in that regard, that, like, just the, just the having the meetings isn't enough. And, you know, we're still at this point where um, I was just thinking, yeah, I think we thought Build Back Better might pass in, like, Memorial Day last year, and now here we are at the end of the year. And so, like, you know, it's still, it's kind of hard to go back to the young change makers and say, and like, what's going on? And it's kind of like, oh, we're still working on the same thing. You know, I think they really expect policy to happen a lot faster, which we know it doesn't happen as quickly as we can. But so I think, yeah, I mean, one of those lessons is also one of the lessons learned for us is to be like, to, to really add some additional um, areas of work that we've focused on. So for example, the young people really were interested in climate justice. And so even with the Climate Corps, for example, like that became a new body of work for us to really focus on that was really important to young people um, as we move forward. So yeah, I think being flexible and also just like recognize and kind of towing the line, you know, we want to keep the access to the administration, of course, and not be like incredibly um, critical or, or whatever when things aren't going well, but we also want to let them know that we aren't, we're still here. So um, that's certainly been a lesson and a, a change, I think, from the last four years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, moving down to Stephanie, our Director of Child Care and Early Education. Um, Stephanie, we are at a pivotal moment for child care. Um, not quite sure I, I thought I would see this um, kind of legislation coming to a vote um, in my lifetime. So tell us what the legislation would do and why it's so important to the class. Yeah, thanks, Hannah, and, and great to be here with everyone today. Um, it really is a pivotal and exciting moment right now where child care is holding strong amidst the ongoing negotiations and processes that are happening in the Senate. In, in terms of what the legislation would do, it will provide a guarantee of high quality child care for families with children under age six and not yet in kindergarten who live at or below 250% of the state median income. Um, no family participating in the program will pay more than 7% of their income in out-of-pocket child care expenses, and families with the lowest incomes won't pay anything out-of-pocket, which is just very different than the way our current system works. Um, it will provide supports and wage increases for providers and create child care jobs that are well-supported and can be sustained. It also establishes universal free pre-K um, or pre-kindergarten for all children ages three and four. And it's truly a transformative plan that would have tremendous impact for children and families and providers and honestly, the country as a whole. And just to touch briefly on your, your question about why it's so important to CLASP, um, that's of course multifaceted. One, childcare is really essential to our mission and our racial equity vision in the organization. Um, two, we um, have been working on this issue for a really long time. We've been advocating for years and decades, um, as many of you on this call know, and, and many others have participated in, um, to you know both promote um, access to childcare and quality of childcare for families. And this will provide an opportunity to be able to uh, realize both of those things. Um, and then the last last piece is just that this bill is based on the Child Care for Working Families Act, which um, is Senator Murray and Representative Scott's child care bill, um, which is significant because we were tremendously involved in drafting that bill numerous years ago with Senator Murray and, and Representative Scott's staff. So we helped to create and influence many of the provisions that came into this bill from that bill and then have subsequently helped to create some of the um, provisions that are included in the bill that were not in that bill as well. The long history of class involvement um, in influencing this legislation. What what have been class major contributions to the advocacy 
um, that we see around Build Back Better. Yeah, so I, I just mentioned a little bit of a history um, related to the bill drafting, um, but I'd also highlight our work on child care throughout the pandemic and how that helped to contribute to where we are right now. So from the very beginning of the pandemic, um, we saw the spotlight on child care, um, both on its value and importance for families, um, but also on how fragile things were and how under-resourced the system was um, and is. And we played an important role in highlighting that, specifically in translating what um, happens on the federal level to states and to the local level and vice versa to share the needs and inform federal policy decisions and investments. Um, you mentioned this, Hannah, and I think Trelon um, alluded to this as well, but at the very beginning of the pandemic, we partnered um, with an economist to determine what relief dollars were needed for the sector and came up with this $50 billion number and started relentlessly rallying around that number. Um, and that analysis analysis and advocacy paired with the advocacy about the specific needs and states led to the over $50 billion in child care relief um, that we saw, including $39 billion in the American Rescue Plan earlier this year. Um, and specific to the um, Build Back Better Act, we have been playing lots of roles, um, including the role of educator with a wide range of different Hill offices, the role of advocate highlighting the needs and advocating for resources to address them, the role of technical expert helping to write and refine the language, and the role of translator um, to the states as we've been learning things on the federal level, as well as the role of trusted partner with other national organizations, the Hill, state administrators, and advocates too. Um, we have um, done a lot of technical work and advocacy around a number of the provisions of the bill. As I mentioned, um, we have um, been in consultation with um, the income and work support team here at CLASP and administrative law experts um, and have made recommendations to the Hill around um, some of the uh, provisions of the bill related to state take up um, of um, the bill and ensuring that in states where the um, state is not able to take it up, that there's a robust fallback option so that um, children can equitably access care. Um, so I could go on forever in highlighting um, all the work the team has been doing to um, contribute to this moment, but I'll, I'll stop there to make sure we don't run out of time. <laughs> Okay, and one last question for you, because of course the work isn't over when the bill passes. Um, looking ahead, should we should the bill pass to implementation next year? What would you see as class priority and role in the coming year? Yeah, thanks for that question. We really have been doing a lot of thinking on this as Build Back Better has become more of a hopeful reality than an unlikely dream, um, as we had been thinking about it before. And while it's not done until it's done, um, this is gonna take a tremendous amount of work um, to implement that requires a lot of planning and partnership. Um, it's our priority in implementation to ensure that this is done well, um, that it's implemented equitably, that it's driven by and meets the needs of parents and providers, and that ultimately it creates a long-term sustainable system of childcare in this country. Um, and obviously um, that's not easy to do. Um, so there's a lot of work um, that lies ahead. And I would say the headline in terms of first steps is that we already have implementation at a new scale, as folks have mentioned underway. You alluded to this earlier, Hannah, um, through the American Rescue Rescue Plan Act implementation. Um, and we have been working with states to think big and long term and um, where possible um, to think about how states can lay the groundwork to be able to um, sort of set the tone and have some of the systems in place um, before Build Back Better becomes um, something that they're working on. There are lots of examples of success. For example, in um, California, they have waived family fees for the next year with resources in the uh, American Rescue Plan. In New Mexico, they nearly doubled their income eligibility, making families who weren't otherwise eligible for the program able to access assistance in this critical moment. So there is already structure and thinking happening um, that will sort of be an on-ramp um, for this, um, for states to think even bigger and build on that. And we also have to think about ensuring that states will take up the program, like I just mentioned, helping states to help their governors understand what this would mean for people in their state. Um, we can't do this alone, of course, and I know um, 
you probably all are familiar with and have previously heard about the Child Care for Every Family Network, which CLASP helped to establish and continues to actively engage in. Um, and the network is in a position to play a big role in implementation to, to provide a coordinating and gap-filling role and to importantly center the voices of parents and providers in all of these conversations and decisions. Um, so we continue to plan and scheme and try to predict the future the best we can, all while continuing to try to get this bill over the finish line. And we can only hope that we are met with such a wonderful problem of an overwhelming state implementation um, agenda in 2022. Agree. Good problem to have. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to move on to Wendy, our, our final panelist. So just remind folks if they do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat as we'll get to them. Um, Wendy, your team has been working across uh, legislative priorities and also administrative priorities. And we acknowledge that there's a lot that's been disappointing on the immigration agenda and a lot that remains undone, um, particularly seeing the path to citizenship um, fall out of, of earlier hopes around the reconciliation bill. But there have also been really important accomplishments that you've been leading on. So please share um, the role that CLASS is playing in the larger immigration agenda and where we're seeing progress. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be with everyone today. So yes, um, much in the same way that we engaged partners previously that weren't engaged on immigration during all of the defensive work of the prior administration, in particular anti-poverty groups and children's advocacy partners, we're doing very much um, the same now on the pro-immigrant side of things. So as you flagged, a lot of our focus on the legislative side has been on securing some sort of relief for undocumented immigrants as part of the Build Back Better Act. And um, a lot of our work has been in supporting the larger effort being led by the We Are Home campaign um, and through engaging our Children Thrive Action Network on advocacy efforts. And yes, the current house passed version um, of immigration relief um, while falling short of the path to citizenship that we and others have been fighting for, um, it would still very much transform the lives of more than 7 million immigrants across the country by giving them lawful status and work permits for the first time. Um, so over the past several months, we've coordinated Hill meetings with CTAN, Children Thrive Action Network for short, um, partners, um, social media campaigns, and a, um, a video premiere event during Immigrant Heritage Month, um, all specifically calling on Congress to pass a path to citizenship. And we also created child specific materials um, throughout all these months, um, including new national and state fact sheets on how a path to citizenship would help lift a quarter of a million children out of poverty. Um, as well as the benefits of restoring access to the child tax credit for, um, for immigrant children. And I think our unique um, anti-poverty and child-focused angle continues to be very important. So for example, last month leading up to House passage of the bill, um, barring access to benefits for newly documented immigrants was actually being debated. And so we, ha we helped work with protecting immigrant families campaign partners to push back quickly and make sure that House leadership heard loud and clear that cutting access to benefits was not acceptable. Um, in terms of places where we're leading, um, a lot of that has been on the cross-cutting administrative advocacy front. So for example, we've helped lead meetings with the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Department of Education on topics like the former sensitive locations policy, which restricts um, where ICE can carry out enforcement actions, um, the rights of detained or deported parents, um, and also on ensuring equitable education access for immigrant students and families. And I'll just flag one of our biggest wins recently was the release of the new Department of Homeland Security agency-wide protected areas policy, which expands on what was the previous sensitive locations policy um, and, um, and improves it and strengthens it, um, expands it to places where children gather like playgrounds and recreation centers, um, places near a protected area because of course, in even our own research, we learned that um, we constantly heard of cases of parents being arrested by ICE outside of schools or on their way to drop off their, ch their child to childcare. Um, and then it also includes um, some provisions that, um, you know, um, um, to ensure better training and accountability. And so um, that's one example of a, of a win that we've had on the administrative front. Thanks. And you've been, you mentioned CTAN in, in talking, the Children's Drive Action Network, and clearly having that cross-sector group of organizations committed to children and mixed status families has been a really important piece of the advocacy strategy. So can you share a little bit about what makes this network so effective? 
Yeah, so the network, um, which we launched last year, and it's now one over, we have over 100 members um, across the country, um, and we have four active working groups. And after about, a, I guess, a year and a half, um, we, we've learned a few things, um, in particular with regards to how to engage children's advocates, which make up a, a, hu a big um, chunk of our membership, um, so that they feel not only comfortable, but effective in doing immigration advocacy. So, for example, creating specific talking points about how a path to citizenship can help fight child poverty and the ways in which children's health, education, and mental health um, can be supported by a path to citizenship really helped our partners feel like these were arguments that they could really speak to with confidence. Um, and it allowed us to get deep engagement and leadership from partners during, during our September week of action, as well as throughout our Hill meetings. Um, it also helped partners feel like they could add immigration um, and a pathway to citizenship um, to the really important and time consuming advocacy that they're already doing on things like childcare as part of the Build Back Better Act. Um, we've also learned that lifting up the impact of immigration policy on children does resonate and can make a difference. Um, sometimes there's mixed results, but um, whether we're talking about harmful or good policies, especially because we've learned that we still need to push our own allies on the Hill and in the administration to be bold on immigration and to reject the racist narrative that immigrants don't deserve benefits and that migrating is a crime versus a human right. Um, so it really does help to have more diversity in the movement. And I think CLASP has helped contribute to that diversity, both through the Children Thrive Action Network, as well as the Protecting Immigrant Families campaign. Yeah, I think both of those um, coalitions have been really critical to the advocacy. Um, last question for you. We um, you mentioned in the beginning the specific um, immigrant, the relief for immigrant families that is in Build Back Better. In addition to that, many of the programs that we've talked about that are included in Build Back Better really create new opportunities for immigrant families to access education and other economic supports, in some cases for the first time. Can you share um, a little bit about that, what's in the, in the bill, and how important implementation will be to seizing those opportunities? Yeah, sure. So there were some really important provisions included in the House passed bill that would specifically support children and immigrant families as well as immigrant students. The first is one that we've mentioned um, earlier in the um, in the panel, which is the affix to the child tax credit um, that we and others have been pushing for for a while. Um, the bill restores eligibility for the child tax credit for approximately 1 million immigrant children growing up in the U.S. who file with an individual taxpayer identification number instead of a social security number. These children, who we also like to refer to as little dreamers, um, were cut off from this critical support as part of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and restoring their eligibility now in particular would make it a big difference for them and their families. So we really want to see that stay in there. Um, we also, um, the bill also includes provisions that would help make post-secondary education more accessible and affordable for immigrant students. Um, so for example, the bill expands access to federal financial aid, including Pell Grants to students with deferred action for childhood arrivals, temporary protected status, or deferred enforced departure. And the bill also includes, in, in, increases Pell Grants um, by $500 and includes immigrant students in tuition assistant grants to minority serving institutions. Um, and also the historical investments to childcare and universal pre-K that Stephanie covered are also inclusive of immigrant families. So eligibility for childcare assistance in the house bill is inclusive of all children, regardless of their or their parents' immigration status and access to universal preschool is available to all children um, who meet the age and income requirements. So as you mentioned, Hannah, to ensure that these benefits truly reach immigrant families, it's going to be very important to ensure that throughout implementation, including guidance issued at the federal and state level, that people are intentional about reaching immigrant families. Um, based on our own focus groups on public charge and the ongoing chilling effect and, and other research that's been done, we know that immigrants remain reluctant to access benefits because of immigration concerns or ongoing confusion about eligibility rules. Um, and even despite the change in administration a year, like almost a year later. And so CLASP, um, given our expertise in areas like immigrant access to benefits and childcare and many of the other issues, um, will definitely have an important role in helping to make sure that implementation meets this challenge and that we um, really do make sure that there is equitable implementation happening. 
Thank you, Wendy, and thank you all for the, the really rich um, and excellent presentations. Um, I think folks can see why I'm so grateful to have you all as colleagues. Um, before we turn to questions, um, I guess I will just add a couple of, of more thoughts as we as we talked about, you know, passage of, of Build Back Better is, is not guaranteed, though you can see why we are fighting so hard along with so many dedicated and committed partners. And as much as this opportunity would, you know, create a really important implementation agenda ahead, I think we're also very aware that even that victory, there will be areas that we need to continue looking to the longer term. We won't let down our advocacy on the full immigration agenda, on our racial equity and justice agenda, and on other areas that have been left out or lessened within um, Build Back Better or could still um, be left unaddressed. So I think one of those pieces is that I, you know, you heard about the child care network, about the children and mixed status families network. I really look to the partnerships that class has been able to create and maintain, maintain the coalitions we've been part of and pushing for all of this, our growing connections with groups on the ground, with the youth advocates, with other organi with organizers, with directly impacted individuals. And I think all of that will really be central to our racial equity mission, to our advocacy, to get these policies right once they pass, but also to continue pushing for the full set of priorities um, and agenda that we have in front of us in 2022, regardless of um, what happens in, in Congress in the next few weeks. So um, really excited to be thinking about what's ahead in all of that space. I'm gonna ask folks to either come off of mute if they want to ask questions or use the raise your hand function whatever um, works best for folks. Anna. Hi, it's so good to see all of you. Um, and for folks that don't know me, I'm Shauna Bartley. I'm a policy officer at the WK Kellogg Foundation. Um, thank you all so much for the incredible work over the last year. Um, I think my question is really just getting to the resource needs for you and your partners and the networks that you all are working with. Um, I'm just curious, you know, I think there's been a lot of conversation amongst, at least at our foundation around like, how are we preparing um, for next year and how are we best um, set up to support all of the incredible work that needs to happen next year. And so if you could just speak to some of the needs you're observing in the work, um, that would be really helpful. Sure, I'm gonna turn to Olivia. Would you like to take this? Sure, I can start and then maybe others can add. So first of all, Shauna, thank you for putting that squarely on the agenda. Um, let me highlight three or four things. The first is, I think the headline is just, there is an enormous agenda, right? The, the work doesn't end when the law is passed. And we can talk about if it doesn't pass or doesn't pass quickly, because that obviously poses a whole different set of enormous agendas in terms of continuing energy and momentum, narrative, building power, looking for executive action. But if it does pass, I think it's really important for funders and supporters to realize that's the big, that's a step along the way, it's not the end. And we've been thinking about kind of four big areas of need. Um, there's an enormous federal advocacy agenda because the federal government gets the money first and has to write regulations and get money out the door. And many of the relevant federal agencies are quite depleted in terms of staffing. Um, the Trump years did a lot of damage. They're often not the right capacity. So there's gonna to need to be a lot of work on that. Second is the state and local governments that implement and deliver, which have enormous needs and, and our capacity and our partners needs for working back and forth. Um, I would note, I think Stephanie highlighted the need potentially in some states for state campaigns that encourage governors and legislators to take the money. There are some situations where that will be needed. That's not the kind of work that is classed alone, but we, as you heard in talking about some of the other coalitions, Child Care for Every Family, some of the other coalitions, we really see a role with partners in generating and supporting that work. So third area is collaborations. Um, 
I do think that one of the goals of implementation is not just get this round of money out, but build the power and the capacity and the partnerships for the next steps. And that takes work. And then I think the final one is communications narrative. In some areas that's immediate. I mean, as you know, I, or many of you may know, some of the provisions in Build Back Better only go for a year, like the expanded earned income tax credit and child tax credit. So delivering the benefits is gonna happen at the very same time as telling the story of why that mattered and it should be extended. So those are some examples and we would be thrilled to talk more about what might be some of the immediate steps. Hannah, do you wanna add anything? I was going to add on the on the narrative and the communications is to just unpack that a little bit more. I think that's right. There is this the piece that is telling the story back to Congress where we need to continue this um, for pieces that are temporary. But I think there's also the um, managing expectations. There there's communicating in the immediate the importance of what's in there, even if it takes a while to stand up. So I think understanding that um, there may be a period of time in which you know families may not immediately feel the impacts of childcare, so how we address that. So I think there's a, a kind of a longer term um, narrative, which it has several different audiences. But thank you for asking it so directly. Other questions, comments? Well, if there are none, um, we, again, are certainly happy to have further conversations offline. Um, and if a question comes, we'll, we'll certainly pause to take it, but I'll turn it over to Olivia to offer some closing remarks. Well, first of all, thank you. I think I'm, I'm looking at Acusia to make sure. I think we are going to be following up with the recording, so you'll also be able to um, ask questions or send additional thoughts in, respon in response to that. I guess I would just say quickly, just to circle around to the to the key points that many of you have made. There's an enormous amount more to do, a point that Shauna just gave us the chance to elaborate on. It's because of you and your confidence in us and your support um, that we've been able to get as far as we have. Um, I also wanna highlight a few other things that came up in those amazing presentations. One, I. I, I was just um, blown away by the quality of all the presentations and the, the leadership, the content, the ability to articulate what's so important in so little time. So you will see that our ability to hire and keep extraordinary staff is crucial to our role and, and your support is part of that. You also heard a lot about our coalition work, which is really central. And I think the history, the respect, the role that CLASP has played um, has given us the ability to be a partner um, th that generates, that supports and generates work by others. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I would say about the year ahead, um, besides that the work is gonna be very intense and all of you are needed, many of you know um, that CLASP will be having an executive leadership transition, probably uh, March or April. Um, and as you know, I'm incredibly proud, even more so today after hearing that panel of the extraordinary work um, of my colleagues over these last almost nine years that I've been at CLASP. Um, and I really believe transitions are, uh, are best at a time of strength, so I'm very excited about the recruitment process, about the board's commitment and support to the work. That adds another reason why your sustained support is so valuable. And we're very grateful. A number of you have already um, committed to supporting a new ED that clasps continuing work. But I just wanna say again, it's a time when sustaining our momentum is more important than ever. And so your continued engagement really matters. I've already promised to Kusia, I'm gonna be a dedicated alum and uh, supporter myself. And I'm, I'm so grateful that so many of the rest of you are. So I think we're just gonna be trying to keep you informed. Please ask us questions. Please join us in crossing your fingers and your toes or whatever you do 
to um, encourage Build Back Better to be passed. The sooner the better, given the scale of remaining work to do. And we look forward to partnering with you in so many ways in the work ahead to advance racial equity and to end poverty. So thank you for everything you've done. And we really look forward to all that lies ahead. Thank you. And with that, Akusia, anything else you want to close with? We're all done.